Right now, though, a story we covered uh, with Ron Mark, and that has really got a lot of people scratching their heads and some kind of serious uh, questions being asked, but also a story to a certain extent shrouded in mystery. The death of off-duty uh, New Zealand soldier Dominic Bryce in Ukraine, who had clearly gone there against official rules to take up arms against Russia f on behalf of Ukrainian forces, was killed in a night operation uh, last week. And now the question is, how do you get this guy home and what is the status of his body? Is his body even with the Ukrainians or do the Russians have it? And what is this? And also, it's clearly been revealed. We have no idea how many off-duty or leave of absence New Zealand service personnel might be serving in Ukraine. And I think this does raise questions as to whether or not that is proper. What diplomatic or international ramifications does that have? And also because we're, I haven't caught up with him for a while, but I think his commentary on the war in Ukraine and geopolitics is generally bang on. We are joined now um, by Professor Robert uh, Patman. Uh, Robert, nice to talk to you again. Welcome back to the platform. Oh, good morning, Sean. Good to speak to you. All right. Well, this, boy, this is kind of a turn up for the books, the death of the, this Kiwi soldier in Ukraine. First, are you surprised? No, I'm not surprised that a New Zealander has been killed who's volunteered to fight on the Ukrainian side. The Ukrainians have been very selective about who they take. You can't just volunteer and go. They're looking for people with uh, pretty high-level military experience who can add to what they've got. And um, it's former soldiers and soldiers uh, like Dominic Abelin, who was on leave without pay, for, that from a New Zealand um, perspective, were, would be the sort of candidates, I suppose, for helping Ukraine in this struggle. The Ukrainians are fighting a very intense war, losing up to 100 to 200 a day in the eastern sector against the Russians. So uh, I guess given that Dominic Evelyn was fighting in the eastern sector, um, we should not be surprised that sooner or later uh, a Kiwi was affected by the war itself. All right. Do we know or could we guesstimate how many other New Zealand service personnel like Dominic might be in theatre at present? Well, there's been various figures banded around, Sean, and uh, to be frank, I do not know. I do not have a definitive figure. Um, the fact that the New Zealand Defence Force is now looking into the number of people who've got leave without pay, um, figures being banded around, and these are figures, this is speculative, what I, this is speculation on my part, Somewhere between 80 to 95 seem to be people who've got leave without pay. That doesn't mean they all went to Ukraine, however. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, 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 there's been a number of Kiwis involved. There's a lot of Kiwis involved on the humanitarian yeah. side. And uh, I, I think something that Ron Mark may have said with you last week certainly struck a chord with me is that Dominic Abelin and many other volunteers are really outraged um, by this unprovoked invasion by Russia of Ukraine. And people who can make a difference sometimes think, why not? Yeah. Um, is it frowned upon, encouraged, ignored by the New Zealand military? My understanding is when you are on leave without pay or on a leave of absence, you are not meant to enter or visit any countries which have a travel advisory or travel caution from foreign affairs. That's my understanding as well. Um, and the fact that Dominic Abelin didn't tell his own family that he was going there until he was there probably suggests that he was less than candid with the New Zealand Defence Force. But we don't know that. That was a conversation that he clearly had with the NZDF. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's very difficult to know, Sean, or be definitive on that issue. Yeah, I, and I guess now the fact that they are looking into people on leave of absence suggests they realise they might have, and I'm not going to say a problem, there might be a number of other mm. uh, New Zealand uh, service personnel who are serving in Ukraine. Does that, Robert, make them technically mercenaries? 
Um, well, they they certainly joined um, a group called I think was the, I think Dom Eblen was part of an international group. Um, I hesitate to use the term mercenaries because I don't think their primary motivation was financial. I think mm, good point. Uh, their primary motivation was to help the victim of aggression. And, you know, it may sound... One of the things I've noticed in the 30 years plus I've been in this country is that most Kiwis have a very strong sense of what is fair. They may not agree what constitutes fairness, but they do have a sense of everybody's entitled to a fair go. And I think what's happened in the Ukraine has really... Uh, most Kiwis are outraged by it. And mm. I, I think that they feel... The world's going to be a more dangerous place if Mr. Putin's allowed to keep some territory which he's basically annexed from a neighbouring country. And I think many people on the humanitarian front and on the military front, if they're available um, and they, they, they had the opportunity, may well want to make a contribution. Yeah, I guess the question would be, would you have called people who joined the International Brigade in Spain during their civil war, would you have called them mercenaries? Because they certainly wouldn't have seen themselves as such, would they? No, no. I mean, I think there are definitely people who are hired guns. That is, people who've got the military skills and are quite indifferent to who they <laughs> mm. fight for, uh, providing the money's right. Mm. Um, but I don't think this is a. I, I don't think that's an appropriate use in this context. Uh, one of the crucial issues, Sean, is when Dominic Ablin was granted leave. And what I mean by that is the timing. Um, was he granted leave after? the Russian invasion mm. of Ukraine, or was it before? If it was before, I think you could fit, say, it, it, you know, it could be a case of New Zealand simply, uh, New Zealand Defence Force simply not, apart from the usual uh, prohibitions which you've mentioned about you know, yeah. certain places where there's travel advisories. Uh, but uh, after the Russian invasion, I thought if Dominic Ebner applied for leave then, uh, then it would be rather strange if a New Zealand Defence Force, given that this is a major international crisis with global ramifications, didn't ask him where he was going or or warned him against it. OK. Under normal conventions, what is the status of a combatant like Dominic Ablin in a theatre of war? And how do you think do the Russians see such people, whether from New Zealand or not? What is his status? What is the status... Of any other well, again, Kiwi that, that might be fighting there. I think the Russians, I'll classify them as uh, as mercenaries. And uh, we already know from the way they've handed out death sentences to two British volunteers um, that they will not get the normal protections of, of combatants. Um, for example, they've got a lot of prisoners of war from, well, I say a lot, they've got about 8,000, I think, prisoners of war from Ukraine. And uh, as far as I know, they're just being treated, uh, hopefully, with the, uh, although the Ukrainians dispute this, with, in, in, in full compliance with the Geneva Convention. At least they should be, because they're mm. prisoners of war. I don't think that status will necessarily be extended to Kiwi volunteers who are captured by the Russians. Right, so that's, geez, that's a pretty serious rider that anyone does go there under those circumstances, realises they may not be well, treated I, in, in normal convention as a prisoner of war. Well, if they're classified as a mercenary, mercenaries are often dealt with very harshly by the country's mercenaries. Have been, if they, you know, I'm not saying Donny Avalon was a mercenary, I'm just saying whether the Russians classify him uh, classified a vo New Zealand volunteer like him as such. If they do insist on that classification, then the way they deal with them, if they get, if they capture them, may be extremely harsh. Mm. And uh, uh, mercenaries traditionally have not been well treated yeah. in other theatres, other conflicts yeah. where they've been captured. Do you think? And I know we're in speculation here, Robert. So I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to hold your feet to the fire. Um, it is entirely possible, is it not, that his body? His remains are actually in a Russian zone, or the Russians have them. Uh, can we expect under these circumstances that they'll happily arrange and go to the trouble of getting his remains back to his family in New Zealand? Well, there was a statement last week by the Russian embassy in Wellington that clearly came from Moscow, 
uh, which indicated it was not their top priority to repatriate, um, as they could it, put it, mercenaries, or, or as we would call it, volunteers, um, like Dominic Abelin. So I'm not, if he, if his body is a lot, there's a great deal of no, uncertainty it, yeah. given the, fo the fo fog of war, but it would appear from the first reports that we have that unfortunately he was killed in an exchange um, trying to capture a Russian trench, which suggests that he may have fallen um, in an area controlled by the Russians. And if that is the case, it may be some time before his, body, his remains are returned, mm. Mm. which is heartbreaking for his family, of course. Yeah. Um, what then for the New Zealand government do they do now? As I said, they're trying to figure out how many people they've got on leave without pay, and I, it seems to me they're going to... They're trying to gather some intelligence to see whether this is a widespread issue. If mm -hmm. it is, or if we've got 20 or 30 people serving there, um, New Zealand trained military personnel on a leave of absence, does that create a diplomatic problem and is it something that our government would want to put an end to? I'm not sure it can put an end to it. I don't think New Zealand can prevent people like former soldiers, not, mm. no longer in active service, going. That's my understanding. Um, they may well want to close what appears to be a loophole where people can go on leave without pay and not really specify too much about mm. what they're going to do during that period. But, you know, to be fair, the New Zealand Defence Force, uh, as I understand it, and I, you know, I hope I haven't got this wrong, but as I understand it, the, the, the terms of leave without pay is normally the mechanism they use when people are approaching perhaps the end of their active career with the New Zealand Defence mm. Force and it's a way of allowing them to release them, but they can come back to a job if that's what they want. Mm. And um, I, I don't think, I, I mean, I think New Zealand Defence Force will be now obviously try, attempting to uh, be much more precise and clear on if mm. people are granted this leave without pay, where they're going. I think that's obviously, they, ha they have that ability. Mm. But retrospectively, they can't do much about those who mm. have gone. Does it do any significant damage with our diplomatic relations with Russia, which of course are strained given that we've essentially sided with Ukraine in this conflict anyway? I think the relationship is very strained and I think there are the, the Kremlin's been very angry, uh, not just with New Zealand, but with a number of countries. They didn't believe that countries would be so supportive of Ukraine. I don't think it's going to, in the bigger scheme of things, be a big deal. Um, there's other countries who've got far more volunteers and, uh, and former soldiers going there. Um, and at the end of the day, the Russians have broken international law. They've broken every rule in the book. They've torn up the UN Charter. Um, they've uh, basically violated a fundamental principle of international relations, which is state sovereignty. They've fundamentally uh, violated a principle uh, which corresponds to that territorial integrity. So they can have no complaints. If they insist, no one made them invade Ukraine. Mm. And uh, Mr. Putin can not, um, you know, really have it both ways. He can't... Uh, break fundamental laws and international relations and then protest that people try to help the victim of his aggression. Mm. And uh, he has to deal with the consequences. Robert, thank you so much for certainly more deeply informing me of the situation there. Just before you thank go, you, sure. and I know we haven't got a lot of time, sure. broad synopsis of where things are at. It would seem the Ukrainians against the odds uh, holding their own in the east a a a and in the south. Mm. They're, they're making some gains. Yes, they're edging forward. Um, and they're, they're very careful because they, they realise that Russia still has very much the edge in, in artillery. But uh, some interesting developments in the last month since we sp uh, spoke, Sean, particularly with what appears to be precision missile strikes in Crimea, which is the territory that Mr Putin proudly annexed in 2014 and suffered no military consequences, well, he's beginning to get those consequences now, and that will be a big blow to him. Uh, also, there's been 
as you probably followed, a number of uh, killings or assassinations of people who have been supportive of Putin, although not necessarily um, uh, closely associated with him. And uh, that will probably make the ruling elite in uh, the Kremlin much more nervous. They probably thought they could carry out this special military operation without the violence actually extending right close to them. Well, they're beginning to discover otherwise. Robert, thank you very much indeed for your time. We will talk again soon. That is uh, Robert Patman, Geopolitical International Relations uh, expert and uh, great for an academic. Robert doesn't mess around with a whole lot of highfalutin terms. We get it pretty, pretty straight uh, from him. So, how many? Um, I'd really be interested in a text from you uh, or a call from you, and you don't have to use names. Do you know someone else, another New Zealand service personnel who might be on the front lines? In Ukraine, and if you want to share their story with us, and and we would we would respect the right to, if you like, anonymity in that section. I would love you to text me on five zero five zero fifty fifty, or ring on oh eight hundred double three double two eight three. Do you know someone who is serving a New Zealand uh, Defence Force person on leave who is actually fighting in Ukraine? And it sounds to me like you know there isn't going to be. Um, much love lost and when it comes to getting back Don, Dominic Abelin's body um, and the Russians are not going to treat him um, under the Geneva Convention, which I don't know would they, would they uh, observe anyway, rotten buggers.